so uh, our next speaker, uh, please apologize if I'm not pronouncing the last name right, uh, Erno Langenberg. Um, uh, Erno is an architect, researcher, and educator based in uh, Rotterdam. He is the founder of the architecture office L Studio and is currently a researcher in digital fabrication at the Amsterdam University of Applied Science. Uh, he holds a Master of Science in Architecture from the Delft Technical University and studied at Aarhus School of Architecture in Denmark. Um, his research focuses uh, on uh, the interplay between digital design and fabrication, combining programming skills, spatial awareness, and creativity with the aim of generating sustainable architectural solution and a new architectural language. Uh, at the Amsterdam University of Applied Science, he works at the Digital Production Research Group as part of the research program Urban Technology in the Engineering Faculty. His work involves researching in the use of digital fabrication to turn urban waste streams into circular products, thus improving the sustainability of cities. Um, he also worked in collaboration with the European Ceramic Work Center in the Netherlands exploring the possibility of 3D printing with clay for architecture, uh, through which he gained experience in various technique uh, using ceramic production, like slip casting, making plaster molds, glazing and uh, modeling by hand. Um, I will leave the screen uh, to you, Erno. Um, do you, can you share a screen? Yeah, I'm gonna try. So, uh, yeah. Uh, thank you for uh, in, uh, inviting me um, and the kind introduction. Uh, I really enjoyed so far the uh, whole presentation of the whole symposium and also the great variety of speakers. So I'm going to add one more material to the whole uh, day and that's uh, ceramics. And um, well, I have a slightly strange title for the presentation, but I hope it will become clear uh, during the presentation. Do you see the next slide? Okay, cool. So, well, um, I thought maybe I introduce first a little bit uh, the context of the work and uh, my working, because since uh, a few years I work at the Robot Lab at Amsterdam University of Applied Science, where we started from uh, scratch uh, to build up a robotic uh, fabrication lab, where we try to uh, combine practice, research, and education. Um, and we work with digital design and digital fabrication with industrial robots. Um, we quickly grew and we are still in the startup phase, but we work mainly with uh, wood and uh, printing, but especially the printing is still um, uh, starting and mainly in plastic. So the project I will be showing you are a bit older. So you know, therefore I thought, um, Maybe it also needs a bit of introduction because it's the work is done in a completely different environment than the academic. It's done uh, during a several residencies, uh, one at the European Ceramic Work Center in the Netherlands in 2014-16 and one in Park residency in Scotland. So it's a slightly different uh, work environment than the previous project. And also uh, the approach is different. It was a more intuitive, a design driven approach is finding out what uh, one could do with the 3D printing and ceramics. Um, it all started uh, with my fascination for uh, digital design and uh, um, when working in projects in Africa, really building in uh, a hospice and at the same time being introduced at the FAP Lab in uh, Amsterdam, I realized and I thought it could be maybe interesting to combine all these aspects and see if maybe through digital fabrication one could uh, um, make uh, architecture production a bit more sustainable and local again instead of a kind of global operation where materials go over the place so thinking about this i thought um, there's a kind of three aspects uh, which combined uh, are important and influence each other of course, there's the material affordance and the post-production and production processes and computational design. And I tried to combine these and see if they could inform each other and make the best of it. As a material for this research, I chose uh, clay. 
initially baked or unbaked because it's a locally available material all over the world and a lot of architectural applications as well like roof tiles bricks and uh, even the interior like toilets and stuff and when you look into 3d printing uh, ceramics you kind of fastly uh, realize that it's a kind of very old technique basically it comes down to a technique which is called coiling clay and it's one of the oldest uh, techniques in uh, ceramics. It's uh, one of the first ones humans used to make uh, uh, vessels. And therefore, it's also quite uh, known. And uh, a lot of people have this kind of tested knowledge of how to use this uh, material with line thicknesses and how to adhere uh, layers. However, uh, the aim was to do digital fabrication. So I was wondering uh, what could this uh, new technology and digital control add to the whole process. And of course, at the same time, uh, architecture is not uh, the same as a vessel or... So how could we uh, change and form these uh, objects so that they become a bit usable for architectural applications? So therefore, I thought the object needs to be opened. We, how can we produce these kind of porous structures I was looking for? And when you say digital control, you think that you have a lot of control. And uh, when people also say that you can make anything when you start printing, uh, uh, when you start with clay, you easily get uh, deceived because there's a lot of things you can't print, like straight walls is very difficult. Of course, it is possible. And overhangs or bridgings are very difficult, uh, maybe in other materials as well. So when you come across these kind of problems, um, there's different ways of uh, mitigating this and going around so uh, to explore what is possible and if we can find other ways of doing it. So the projects I will be showing you are uh, different ways of approaching these problems to make uh, uh, porous elements for architecture. So this was one of the first attempts where I tried to explore what would be possible if you would use the uh, printing uh, technology at that time available, which was, there was no stop and go yet. So we had to do a continuous uh, printing process. And luckily, for example, clay is very malleable still when, when it's wet, when it comes out of the print. So you can easily make cross sections and interlocking tool paths, which also are very good while printing because it makes the print very strong. So, after these ones, I thought, let's see if we can make something bigger, which looks a bit more like an architectural application. So it's a part of a dome, which could be uh, built out of elements with, with the intention to stack them without uh, any uh, glue in between. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, printing path, for example, was uh, informed by the idea of having openings which could change according to the need uh, of the structure to uh, provide uh, uh, shadow or, or uh, airflow. And for example, not, uh, it didn't have any structural implications. The only structural element might be that uh, the, the top layers are thinner. It has the same amount of layer, but because of the lower extrusion rate, the bricks become lighter because there's not so much weight at the top. Another project, which was uh, looking into this idea of um, making porous structures and in a completely different approach was the idea of adding another material to the mix because uh, uh, the, in order to get ceramics, the clay has to be fired in the kiln, uh, which at, at these temperatures, anything other, other than the clay will disappear, like any organic material will burn away or some other material mixes will uh, just pulverize into powder. So I thought this could be very well uh, used to make um, uh, yeah, porous structures if you could print the same uh, two materials at the same time. So uh, at the European Ceramic Center, we built a kind of a, a small or like simple dual clay extruder and we started experimenting with materials which appear to be quite uh, challenging because the material had to be both printable and also disappear in the kiln. And some materials unexpectedly became glazing, which was exactly what we didn't want, of course. However, in the end, we did find some materials which uh, were working. 
we found a kind of uh, organic uh, mix which was uh, disappearing in the kiln, but it was rather hard to print. And the best was working a kind of inorganic mix of bentong and some other ingredients, which then in the oven pulverized into a powder and easily released the printed form. And um, well, this was uh, uh, all we could do in the limited scope of the project, but I think it's a kind of a potential uh, to find another material, but we need uh, further research into this. Uh, one kind of uh, aspect which came out of this project was that because we had to or had to change the tool pathing and another way of printing, I also discovered that you could also make other shapes. And this was just a kind of formal exercise into finding out if it was possible to change the look of these uh, printing elements instead of having this uh, aesthetic of horizontal layers. I thought it would be interesting to see if you could uh, print something on the outside of the existing prints to change this uh, aesthetic. And uh, also this, uh, yeah, this uh, the continued uh, improvement of control over the printing uh, during time uh, was the reason for the next project, which was uh, explored in uh, Scotland, which was um, another way yet of trying to open up this um, uh, prints, open up the vessel. And the, my idea was that if you would alternate the layers, direction, uh, each layer, uh, you would uh, open up the structure because uh, air would go through. It's like stacking like sticks uh, on top of each other. <clears throat> However, uh, the material clay doesn't bridge very well, as we've seen in the beginning, but in this case, it became a kind of uh, controllable feature because it, it doesn't uh, bridge very well, but it always collapses in the same way. So it's a kind of controllable element you can play with and still have an open structure. So in the end, I discovered that if you would just uh, repeat the same structure, the same script uh, in different uh, uh, variations. So these are, uh, we call 24 elements in uh, stoneware, but uh, with the same script with different variations. And you clearly can see that it, it becomes a kind of uh, ornamental column with a kind of predictable outcome, but also some kind of organic feel to it, which I thought was uh, kind of appealing. And then one of the last uh, techniques I explored, I'm showing you is a, a bit more recent, is the idea of um, uh, printing uh, within a mold. It's also done in uh, classic ceramics, like uh, you could coil by hand into a mold or pour liquid uh, uh, clay by hand. And um, of course, while doing it with a machine, you have much more control over the whole situation. And you can make very in intricate, complicated shapes like this one, for example. And uh, these ones uh, were not meant to be architectural objects. They were um, meant to be uh, plates. But I can easily uh, imagine the application for architecture because uh, if you have a mold, you can uh, customize, mass customize in a very flexible and fast way, um, a ceramic uh, facade element, for example. Uh, the last project I want to show you is a non-finished uh, uh, project. Uh, it's actually only a sketch, but I thought it would be interesting in the context of uh, this uh, 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 symposium. It's the first time I'm showing it because it's just, it's rather new, but um, it's a commission by the uh, organization called Fabrikater and located in Nijmegen in the east of uh, the Netherlands, close to um, in a river landscape. And they try to explore what you could do with uh, local clay from the river. So they ask uh, artists and uh, designers to come up with uh, solutions or ideas uh, what to do with their clay. So projects were done with throw away uh, coffee cups and plates and also uh, printing with ceramics with the, with the local clay was explored. So they asked me to see if they could maybe uh, scale up this uh, use of the printer and see if we could make an architectural element uh, 
is this uh, material. So they are located next to the river, and this is their uh, well laboratory where they produce stuff. And uh, we came up with the idea to make a, a facade tile um, for one part of the building, not to make it too complex. And it's a, of course it's an existing building, so the facade element would be only a decorative element, just to try out. And um, I have to come back. Yeah, the, the, one of the ideas is that it would be made very locally that, so that we, we would use it with the material available there and also the tooling available there. So everything would be uh, customized. And um, if you would do that uh, on the top left is the starting point. If you would tile it in some kind of way, you would have always a lot of exceptions, especially because the building is an existing building. Um, yeah, you can imagine that it's, enough, uh, it's not straight in all the places. And there was also, I thought maybe if you could scan it and then get a really accurate reading of the uh, existing building. But um, one idea is that, of course, for the 3D printer, it doesn't matter you know, to uh, make uh, exceptions and making uh, strange prints. But then I thought like, yeah, why bother to make square ones to begin with? So let's try and make all of the tiles exceptions. And then we can make a kind of a funny and smooth transition between the rectangular outside of the building and the curved uh, inside of the building, the curved uh, arch opening, and create a kind of wavy uh, pattern. Um, unfortunately, the building had to be taken down, so we're still waiting for this uh, project to be continued. But we're sure at the uh, summer. Um, Next summer, we they will move to a new location and we continue the project and see uh, what we can do there. But the reason why I was showing this is because something else uh, previous speakers have been talking about because of the process and the printing times. Because uh, in this kind of project, because we wanted to do it locally, um, there were only limited resources available. So you start digging, you prepare the clay, you 3D print, you fire it, and you give us to glaze it with local materials, fire it again, and then you mount the tiles. But when you start adding all this up, if you have only one printer which was available um, and a limited amount of size tile, like three, 30 by 30 centimeters, you would spend 30 full days printing um, because you cannot uh, leave the printer uh, unattended, so you cannot print through the night, which is uh, a bit difficult, of course, and it didn't fit in the time frame of the project. So I thought already, if you would make a little print farm, it would already be a bit more acceptable. A week of printing, you would say, okay, well, so that that would be feasible, no? And um, and the, and the kilns would not be a big problem because you don't, you can leave them unattended. Um, Having said this, this is only just a little facade. Oh, I'm running out of time. Um, so I thought what happens if you would uh, print uh, in this fashion a whole building? Uh, I did a quick, uh, very scientific Google search. And the first hit was that it said 8,000 bricks are needed to be, make a single house. If you would do it in this way, like I just described, it's uh, fairly impossible. You would need 500 days of printing. So that leads me to the last slide. And that's mainly a, a, a bit of a discussion plate, which is uh, where would we go if we would uh, really be serious about using ceramics in uh, 3D printing ceramics for a building environment, a small scale project you can easily do like I described before, but if you want to scale it up building size, you need a different process, especially because ceramics uh, is different than the next project, for example, uh, you need a uh, a kiln to fire the places, uh, the pieces. So I think it's, we have to think about how to implement this printing in an existing or a new uh, industrial environment and maybe possibly also involve robotics to pick and place all the 3D printed pieces and put them in the right uh, place. Okay, so I think I'm done, yeah, yeah. So that was it. I thought uh, I'll leave, you, uh, leave this up for discussion and uh, I want to thank you for your attention and see whatever questions come up. 
Thank you, Anna. Um, uh, very, uh, very interesting project. So uh, you also came back to it yourself. Uh, I was surprised when you were showing the small tiles and I was like, why would you print such a small tile with 3D printing when you can print larger? Obviously you need the oven. And uh, I'm just wondering if you're thinking, um, well, I have two questions. One, do you think there's other ways to cure the material beyond the way we are doing it right now um, as we are printing? Uh, you mean uh, the clay material? Right. Um, well, you could leave it uh, un unfired, but then it will slowly disintegrate. And depending on the climate you're in, it will take longer. Or, or in Holland, it would take, uh, it will disappear quite fast. Right. So, I mean, uh, the room, the, the, heat, the heating room will be the constraint of the size, right? Yeah. And there's yeah. different ways. Uh, I mean, uh, in the industry, there's a kind of like, uh, yeah, it's like a factory, you know, the, the, the tiles go in a big machine and they, they come out baked. So, and there's all kind of uh, things in between. You have the small one, which was available at location, but you have the slightly bigger ones. But I think it's unavoidable that you uh, fire the bricks. Right. And then uh, also on the other hand, there's also a shrinkage as soon as you fire them. and. Uh, how would you count for that right now as you are working on this facade, let's say, like, are you having that as part of your design tolerance or? Um... Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, you, you know, uh, up front, the shrinkage. So you could right. uh, uh, calculate for that. You can just make your pieces bigger, uh, print them bigger. But this, of course, you have to find out because um, for, um, how would you say that? Uh, uh, mixes you would buy from the shop, you know exactly the shrinkage, but because this is a locally uh, delved clay, it's a bit more unpredictable. So you would have to do some tests before. Yeah, that leads me to uh, to the question of the, the material mix mixtures. Um, you said like you, you want to emphasize the local materials. Yeah? And I guess for the for 3D printing the clay, you need to have a what is it? A very consistent material, um, yeah, quality somehow. So I was wondering if if it uh, like how much work it is to make the local materials really work for the for the three D printer, or do you use any? Um, do you add anything to these materials? I really enjoyed also the study of the uh, dissolvable or burn away material. So can you um, yeah expand a little bit on that? Uh, well, you have two two questions, but yeah. Uh, the, the first one, um, well, I think it's not super critical the material to print with, as long as it depends, of course, a bit on the, uh, the nozzle size. But if you scale it up a bit, it, it, most of the prints will come out, and um, the the clays I used so far are. Uh, non-treated. We didn't add anything except a little bit of water to make it a bit more uh, smooth to come out of the printer. So I think that's not a really a big problem. You do, however, yeah, if you really dig the, the clay just out of the river side, you have to clean it. No? Of course, from stones and uh, all kind of other uh, uh, organic materials which are in there. And um, uh, the, the other one was not really a question, was it? Was uh, you asked me to elaborate on the? Yeah, I mean, in general, this idea of uh, creating new materials that interact really well with clay somehow. Yeah, you mentioned this burn away material, this more organic material. Uh, because I was thinking, yeah, I mean, in concrete, you see that there's a lot of uh, yeah material scientists that uh, contribute to to uh, yeah. Uh, optimize uh, concrete for for the three D printing process. So I was wondering what is going on in in uh, clay and ceramics in in that domain of developing uh, yeah materials for it or edi additives kind of. Uh, I'm not sure. I think it's uh, well. I might not be aware of all kind of uh, material experience. Uh all over, but as far as I know, it's quite uh, basic. There's of course additives to clay and that's mainly to make it more uh, stable during production. 
you can add already fire clay to it, like little grains. And um, I, I've known some people added uh, some alcohol to the prints to make them uh, dry faster. That's as far as I know of it. Yeah, That's because I mean, hmm? I mean, I was just going to say, as soon as you start scaling up, you will deal with deformation and you need to kind of deal with uh, curing the material as you print higher, right? Um, and it's not, I mean, yeah, I mean, the shrinkage will occur while you are printing as well as when you put it in the, in the oven for it to cure. Uh, so it's kind of a complicated, it's a, it's a difficult material to work with. In yeah, yeah, for sure. It's a very difficult material because it shrinks while printing in it and in the oven. And also depending on where in the oven. So I think in the, in the end, if you will use it as a building material, you need to account for quite some tolerances uh, in your design. Yeah, but it's not really a, a big problem, I think. Yeah, there have been some very nice project on a uh, clay facade I've seen uh, been going on, uh, which was interesting. We've been testing and there has been like loading up material uh, constantly. That's another issue because you want to pump the clay. The viscosity is another issue, uh, whereas with concrete, you can pump it and then you mix uh, admixture at the tool head. And here you are dealing with the very different, uh, in, a, in some way similar, but very different complexity uh, to pump clay, for example. I mean, I'm not sure you're even pumping it right now. We haven't pumped. No, it's not, uh, no, it's not really, yeah, it's, it comes from a cartridge, it's kind of pumped. But right. I think eventually, if you would scale up, you would get a bit more, because. Uh, I've seen factories where they make ceramic building elements for skyscrapers and it's not, they also have their big storage and big extrusion profiles. So if you would end up uh, somewhere in between these two, I think it, it, it could have a big potential because uh, this technology of extruding clay is not uh, very new. It's just a completely different scale than the, the printing, I would say. Right. 